I'm going to give a general outline of where is the radioactivity in a, in a reactor that's decommissioned, what kind of exposures could you get if you were actually, you know, in contact with this material, <clears throat> uh, what is going to happen in the future at uh, San Onofre. I'm going to give a general overview. This is decommissioning 101. There you go. Oh, good. Oh, you recognize it now. <laughs> this was going to have me talk about Mitsubishi uh, and their failed uh, steam generators. Okay. Uh, this is a pressure water reactor. I can talk with this. Uh, hot water under pressure, pressure water reactor. Uh, goes to a steam generator. All this isn't to scale. The steam generators are going to be much larger in this picture. Uh, steam generator then generates steam in, an, in a separate loop. Uh, you're not supposed to have a leak from this side over to this side. But that's what was happening with the Mitsubishi steam generator. Holes were forming in the steam generator tubing, and some radioactive material was getting from this cycle over to this over here. Whoops. Oh, good. As you get closer to a nuclear, to nuclear fission, and assume that there's a reactor in here, uh, the radioactivity levels go higher. Uh, and here, one is this, what's called the biological shield. Uh, and the radioactivity levels I have there are 36 curies per cubic meter. And the levels on the inside of the concrete are on the order of two to four rems per hour. It, a rem is, well, background radiation is on the order of 0.1 rem per hour, per year. Okay, so this is two to four rems per hour on the inside of this biological shield. When they eventually take apart the reactor, which is inside here, they'll fill this with water and do that all uh, with, with water shielding. Whoops. Then when you get closer into the reactor itself, when you're out in this vessel, when the inner cladding, there you're talking about 1.5 thousand curies per cubic meter. And you're talking about higher radiation levels. When you get into the thermal shield here, then you're talking about 0.15 million curies per cubic meter. And the radiation field is on the order of, the dose rates are on the order of 80,000 rems per hour. And finally, when you get into the shroud, which is, which is this li line right here, then you're talking about 3 million curies per cubic meter, over 600,000 uh, rems per hour. And all that has to be taken apart, and it has to be taken apart with uh, water shielding. The dose rates decline very slowly. Well, they decline rapidly when cobalt-60 declines away. Cobalt-60 has a half-life of five years. But the radionuclides that we looked at in 1976 were nickel-63 and nickel-59. And if you look at those, the radiation levels decline very slowly. And a year after we published this paper, uh, Robert Paul at Cornell found niobium-94 also extremely important as a radioactive uh, uh, material. 
So it doesn't show very well, but this is the number of years. There's 120 years over here. Uh, and the total curies is just declining very slowly over time. So what can you do about this? There are two alternatives, as I mentioned before. One is to dismantle the reactor, take it all apart uh, fairly promptly. All the fuel has been taken out of the reactor now at San Onofre. It's sitting in fuel pools or it's sitting in dry casts uh, uh, on the site. So you can dismantle the reactor, uh, terminate the license. You still have the spent fuel sitting in casts. Um, however, you can't take all the fuel out of the fuel pool. It has to cool down sometime. Uh, it has to f cool down from 5 to 20 years, depending on the burn-up, how much uh, electricity each fuel assembly has generated. When I looked at some of the reports, it said with the high burn-up fuel, you have to let it cool down for 20 years before you can put it in these containers. So now we're talking about uh, 2033 when they finally get all the fuel into, into um, storage casts. So I don't know if, if maybe you can tell me, I don't know whether it's yet been stated what uh, SoCal wants to do at the reactor, whether they want to put it in safe store. Most utilities now want to put reactors in safe store and, and essentially walk. Maybe in question and answer you can tell me. Uh, this is uh, a reactor that I worked on, uh, Connecticut Yankee reactor in Connecticut, uh, where they've taken apart the entire reactor and this is what remains. Uh, 40 casts have fuel in them and three casts over here on the side have these hotter components from the reactor itself. Uh, this is what I call the Stonehenge concept of, <laughs> of uh, waste storage. Very good. But this is what's being done at uh, San Onofre. In, which, in this case, the casts I'll show another slide shortly. The casts sit horizontally uh, in the containers. And right now there are 40 uh, casts sitting on the site like that. Um, 22 from Psalms 1 and 18 from Psalms 2. Uh, and the estimate is there will be another 126 once they remove all the fuel and put it into these containers, and another 10 holding parts of the reactor, the hot parts of the reactor. So let me see, 40, 126, 166, 10, 176 modules like this. This is what, the, this is what is sitting inside uh, all of those modules, those concrete boxes. The fuel is slipped into uh, these slots, this lattice work. Well, first, this canister is put inside a transfer cask and it's put into the fuel pool itself. Then the fuel is inserted into the canister, the um, cover plate is put on, they pull, they pull the entire assembly and the transfer cask out of the pool and evacuate it uh, through those valves. And then they pump helium in and then they sit to see whether the helium 
uh, does not have a high leak rate. And if everything goes all right, then they put another cover over the top and weld that as well. Then the entire assembly is pulled out. The assembly, this canister plus the transfer cask around it is pulled out of the pool, is pulled out of the building and brought over to the, those modules. You can't just, you know, put any fuel in in any order. You have to make sure that the hottest fuel is on the outside, the fuel that's creating the most heat, and the cooler fuel is put on the inside. That's, I guess, obvious to you. Uh, the casts that they've used so far hold 24 fuel assemblies though they're asking for permission for casts that hold, for canisters that hold 32 fuel assemblies. Uh, they haven't been given permission yet, but this high burnout fuel is an issue uh, for these uh, canisters that hold 32 fuel assemblies. Then this entire system, the, the canister, is pushed out of the transfer cask into this concrete box. And then the entire system is cooled passively. Cool air comes in here, and cool air goes out the top. Hot air goes out the top, sorry. <laughs> cool air through the bottom, just like a chimney. So this is the fuel pool where the cask, the canister, and the transfer cask are put. The fuel is put into it, and then it's taken out to the, once it's sealed up, it's taken out to the horizontal modules, and then the entire container is pushed into uh, the, the module itself, and there it sits. When it comes time to remove it at some future time, then they get the transfer cask, they pull the cask out, they pull the canister out into the transfer cask, and they move it all over to a transportation overpack. Okay, these are some of the issues uh, involved here. Uh, one is concerned about the total heat within these canisters. Uh, as I mentioned, you have to, you can't just put the hottest heat, you know, in the center of the cask. You put it on the outside. Uh, and some cool fuel has to be cooled down 20 years. Um, you can't just put any fuel in. The fuel actually has to have some burn up. You have to use up some of the uranium-235. You don't want a cast to go critical. You know, you want the reactor to do, is where uh, the criticality occurs. Um, so they have to put, in addition, they don't just have st stainless steel plates that separate the fuel. These are boral plates, plates that absorb neutrons that, have, that are uh, in the canister itself. Another issue involves this, these containers that hold 32 fuel uh, assemblies. Uh, there are 10 reactors in the country that have these uh, canisters that hold 32 fuel assemblies, but none of them have been licensed for fuel that is really hot. Well, here's a f my first cask that was developed. This is from my Italian slideshow. These are wine casts, cast 1.0. 1, 1 but this is the one that they are used. Once, if, once they would transport it out of San Onofre to somewhere else, wherever that is, uh, they would put the canister inside this overpack, transportation overpack. And you see this picture shows it's on rail these casts are fairly heavy. You can't carry them on the highway. 
fortunately the rail trip railroad tracks are close to the plant you have lead which shields the gamma radiation you have another layer of neutron absorbing material on the outside you have impact limiters that impact the cask if there's an accident and the impact limiters are involved it will absorb some of the blow and that would be taken to I don't know where there's no place to take there's no place to take the fuel right now uh, first you have to get it over to the rail line uh, unless they build a rail spur into San Onofre uh, you'll have to carry it over and they did do this for the steam generators they had a heavy haul configuration similar to this uh, which carried the steam generators and this shows how long it is 220 feet this this extra truck in the back is called a pusher you know if it happens to be going over hills um, but you can see you can compare the length of this object to all these other objects you know a bus is 30 to 40 feet long and this is 220 feet uh, and they travel very slowly multi-wheel these are the you see the issues that I see uh, there's timing uh, there's a long cool down period for high burn up fuel this fuel is is fairly hot uh, usually the hottest I've seen at other reactors is on the order of 60,000 megawatt days per metric ton and this fuel is 67,000 megawatt days per metric ton and as Arjun pointed out earlier we don't know how they got permission to do that because it hasn't been analyzed you know uh, the issue of who pays is important I, I looked over the uh, the amounts that are in the decommissioning fund and they're quite it's they are quite large uh, most of the decommissioning that's taken place in this country the costs are on the order of a billion dollars uh, generally the amount that's been estimated is always uh, the amount that is actually paid is always higher than the amount that's been estimated if you look at NRC estimates and compare it to the actual payment uh, it's usually at least doubled I know from Connecticut Yankee reactor uh, the estimated cost was on the order of 500 million and it cost over a billion dollars to uh, finally take that reactor apart um, and in the case of uh, San Onofre the decommissioning funds are quite large uh, my uh, reading is they will go on the, up to the order of two billion dollars for each plant and that's the uh, amount that's already been put away um, what's a little confusing to me is the Department of Energy says that they are going to pay for the storage you know for all of the uh, removing fuel from the reactor and putting it into dry storage and eventually transporting it and that comes to on the order of for San Onofre on the order of 350 billion dollars for each reactor uh, yet in um, proceedings before the Public Utility Commission as far as I'm able to determine uh, San Onofre isn't given a, a credit for what the Department of Energy is going to reimburse them for so it's included in the decommissioning cost uh, perhaps somebody who's been involved in Public Utility Commission can straighten me out on this, but it looks uh, like double counting. Uh, whether San Onofre gets money from Mitsubishi, I, I don't know how that's going to turn out either. There have been, I read the newspaper headlines as much as you, and the recriminations that are going back and forth. So I don't know how that's going to remain. What fun it. 
once the reactor is finally taken apart and the fuel is sitting there, then what? The fuel is sitting there till what? Till there's a place to take it. Um, well, in the interests of full disclosure, I do work for the state of Nevada and on nuclear transportation issues. And at least as long as Harry Reid is there, they're probably, the fuel is probably not going to go, go to Nevada. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen. Are the utilities going to consolidate the fuel and put it into one location that's away from water? All reactors are near water. Um, put it into the desert somewhere. I just don't know. I, I can't tell as to what's going to happen next. Uh, it, it may sound a little strange to you, but the situation here is a lot, a lot better than it is in Vermont. Uh, in Vermont, we have what's called a merchant plant, a plant that has no ratepayers, uh, who just sells electricity to other companies. And so we can't go after them to get any extra money, uh, unlike SoCal, which still still has still is soaking you for, uh, you know, for shutting down. Um, and so I don't I don't really know what's go what's going to happen here. We're, we, it, in Vermont, we're trying to encourage the. Uh, the governor to take the site by eminent domain and order the company to clean it up. Uh, that is sort of a radical notion. Hopefully it will lead to some kind of negotiation. Uh, here, the Navy owns the site. Uh, and I'm not familiar with the full details of the agreement between the Navy and SoCal, but I think it's SoCal has to clean up the site to what it was, uh, you know, initially. That's all I have. I'm ready to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, by the way, every one of these slides that you've seen and will see today are up on SantanoFreeSafety.org. That's SantanoFreeSafety, uh, all one word, dot org. You referenced their request to um, increase the number of units per cast from 24 to 32 units. And it just sounds like uh, kind of reminiscent of what they did at Mitsubishi um, to supersize the steam generators and include more units than initially designed for. What are your thoughts on um, that and what ramifications it might have, especially um, in relation to, like you mentioned, the, the boral plate thickness, and if you put more units in there, is that going to mean like less space for boral plates, or how does that work? The concern is uh, the amount of heat that's in the uh, canister itself. Uh, you don't want the canister to to overheat. That is to say. There's certain passive cooling that takes place, you know, where, where cool air goes in the bottom and hot air out the top. Uh, and you can't have it so that the, it continues to heat up and passive cooling is not effective. Um, and the effect of that would be on the fuel assembly cladding itself. These fuel assemblies are long assemblages of thin tubes where the uranium is stacked inside like uh, poker chips stacked inside. Uh, and you can't have the, the um, cladding become so brittle that when you get it out there, you know, try to transport it, it just shatters. Uh, and there effectively is not a barrier to uh, material getting into the canister itself. And then if there's a major accident, uh, and there can be accidents where um, the canisters uh, do break, do, do release material to the environment. 
Uh, we have a paper we've written on that for the state of Nevada. Uh, and there will be a hearing coming up in, uh, in Washington, D.C. by the Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board in, in um, November, November 18th and 19th, that looks, at, looks ab on this issue exactly as to what will be the effect of storage uh, for high burn-up fuel, uh, the effect on transportation, and eventually disposal. Uh, so I don't have all the answers today, uh, and I'm going to tell the and you know the technical review board exactly what they should be doing about it, you know what how they should be researching it. But uh, that's that's the effect uh, that it will degrade the fuel assembly so that in an accident there, there could be serious repercussions. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my question is uh, adding to the uh, dry storage casks. When I read the Blue Ribbon Commission report of uh, January 2012, the U.S. Navy has its Idaho lab where they have dry storage casks that they are described as going into final geological deposit. <laughs> and they are transportable, and that because they have to be out of Idaho by 2035, or the fine is like 17,000 a day or something like that awful, um, is it that they have, do not have the high burn up fuel? Is this strictly because we are dealing with this fuel no one knows about, or is it just kept in secret, and is it just because of cost of the storage system that the Navy is having to use. In your question, you say something about Idaho? Yes, the Idaho lab, that's the one I read about in that report, where the U.S. Navy has to move all of its spent fuel out of Idaho by 2035, and they are right now putting that into final geological disposal casks that are transportable. That's the way the language of the report is. So I want to know if those are possible for San Onofre, regardless of cost, because having the state of California become an economic disaster has to be more expensive. So I just I don't trust Southern California Edison to come up with a, uh, a, a an expensive solution. I would like us to I'd like to understand if there is a solution. There's a whole bunch of questions you asked there. Um, Right now, all the fuel is being stored in containers that hold 24 fuel assemblies, and San Onofre, SoCal would like to move it into containers that hold 32 fuel assemblies because they obviously think that would be less expensive. Um, the what was the question about the Navy? <laughs> Oh, oh, okay, yes, okay. The, the containers that, they're, that they have in San Onofre, the fuel is in these canisters. It's in, in this horizontal structures. If they were to transport it, they have a system to do that. They would actually pull the canister back into the transfer cask and they would go over to a transportation overpack and put, push the canister into the transportation overpack. So they have a way that they can actually, there's an end game that they see to get the fuel out of uh, San Onofre, except there's no place to put it, no place to send it. Do you have a comment on the safest that we can find in the country? Some are 30 years, some are 40 years, and the Navy has a final deposit. So how do we get the best? I don't know how to answer that question. There's no place to send the fuel. Uh, there have been attempts at uh, having storage locations, say, in Utah, uh, where they could send the fuel. Uh, but there's no present, presently licensed location uh, that's foreseeable. In Fukushima, dry storage evidently did survive. So what I'm hearing Southern California Edison say is they have to wait all these years before they really start putting it into dry storage. I want to make sure it's not just 20 year fall apart dry storage so that my granddaughter has to deal with it. 
how do we get the kind of canisters that the U.S. Navy is seeing our final deposit? They're made, they're made right now today somewhere, according to that report. How do we get that in San Onofre? That is what is, is I sound like an apologist for SoCal, but that is what they're, that is what they're doing right now. Uh, they, are, they are moving it into a transport, they would move it into a tr transportation overpack and then they would take it to a repository. In the repository, that would be slipped into another container and that would be disposed of in the repository. There is an end game if there's a repository. But is there a better canister is what she's asking? Than the one they're using. You mean is there one lot? Let's like, keep with the mic, folks. Yeah. Is there a better canister than the New Homes canister is what you're asking. They all look very similar. Uh, the New Homes is the horizontal one. The uh, whole tech canister is the vertical one. Uh, they both operate the same way through passive cooling. Um, and uh, Arjun is going to talk a little bit about uh, hardened storage to make sure that there's no um, way that uh, a sabotage event could affect uh, the canisters. He's going to talk about that. Um, other than that, they, they're, they're similar as far as I can tell. Where you get the figures for uh, the doses inside the bio shield, uh, two rem uh, per hour, and also the, uh, is the 67,000 megawatt days per metric ton of uranium. Can you pull uh, the mic closer? Can you uh, I mean, that's a vi that would be a violation of law. San Onofre doesn't have any of that, and they've already put some of this high burn fuel in uh, dry cast storage. So I, I'm not sure where the 20 years is coming from either. Because, you know. As far up, as I'm aware, they haven't put the high burn up fuel into containers yet. Yeah, they, uh, very few of it, but they put some in there. And also the, the dose rates inside the BioShield, was that from a different plant? Because I've been in the bio, inside the BioShield at power. And, I wouldn't be in there if it was two rim per hour. As I said, as far as I'm aware, the high burn up fuel, has, the 67,000 megawatt day per metric ton has not yet been approved for, uh, right, for yeah, placement six, into a cask. Right, 60,000 is the max, and San Onofre does not have any of that. That's right. Richard Bannister from Dana Point. We have been storing uh, fuel in the United States uh, in dry storage. How many, how many years have we been storing it in the United States in this dry storage? How many years have we been storing it at San Onofre in dry storage? And have there been any problems with it? I don't know if I know the exact time. The, I think the, 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 first, the first dry storage cast were the caster casts that were used in uh, Virginia. Um, and I think that was in the what 1990 around 1990 yeah um the the only problems that i'm aware of are some of the casts have had leakage of uh, helium out of, out of the cask helium is a conductor a better conductor of uh heat than um air and so it's important to have helium uh within the cask under pressure uh that's what that's the only problem that I'm aware of at this time uh, some of the fuel that's been in the cast for some time like at Turkey Point uh, hasn't been um, really analyzed the cladding in particular around the fuel itself hasn't really been analyzed for high burn up fuel hello thanks for being here with us today um, I wanted to back up a little bit and just ask you and maybe I just missed it in your your presentation, but when you talk about the water shielding that will happen when they actually dismantle the reactor, I wanted just to, from my own understanding and other people's understanding, have a little bit more description of how that process works. When you say water shielding, just basically what, what is going to happen with that? Well, essentially the same thing that they did at Three Mile Island about five years after the, this partial meltdown, uh, where they had, they had to cover uh, all the, 
internals of the reactor with water, and they had to do it all with tools that could reach down, and so the, so the workers themselves weren't highly exposed to the radiation uh, that was in the reactor itself, in the nuclear fuel itself. That's how they would do it. Uh, they would take apart everything uh, uh, underwater, take apart the reactor itself underwater. I mean, what happens to that water after they're done? Do you have any idea? You mean while you're out surfing? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> This is supposedly the water is put through purifiers. It is, it's put through uh, ion exchange resins that, uh, which they do while the reactor's operating generally anyway, uh, to clean up uh, the water itself. When San Onofre was, uh, it was determined they were gonna decommission it, it, it I, I heard that it was the fastest decommissioning process ever. For some reason Edison, wanted uh, to relinquish the license and de start the decommission process very quickly. Did that have anything to do with liability for the next steps of decommissioning, the moving of the fuel, the, the, the containerizing them of the fuel and, and possibly transporting the fuel? And is, is there any relationship to Price Anderson? Maybe the, maybe the bottom line question is, is, who is responsible now for an accident regarding decommissioning? Is it Edison? Is it the Department of Energy? Who, who's taking responsibility for accidents now? For accidents? If there's an accident now. It depends how serious the accident is, whether Price Anderson insurance kicks in. And I have to say, I'm a little unsure about the timing of this as well. Uh, while the reactor is operating, Utilities contribute insurance. They have their own insurance and they contribute to Price Anderson insurance. And above a certain amount, Congress is supposed to come into play. Um, good luck on that. Um, so, the react so the accident has to be serious before Price Anderson is involved. Otherwise, the company has minimal insurance to take care of uh, accidents. While the fuel is being moved, and I'm a little unsure about the point when you take the fuel out of the fuel pool and put it into dry storage, but from dry storage on, I'm fairly certain the Department of Energy then has responsibility. And I think the Department of Energy is responsible for the cost of actually taking it out of the fuel pool and putting it into dry storage as well. Um, that's my best understanding. My name is Suresh Makijani. Just a coincidence that uh, we have another distinguished speaker with that same last name. And I'm just an ordinary man here, even though I'm an engineer, and I've seen all kinds of uh, process descriptions here and two words have been already used uh, in this presentation. One is sabotage, and the other one is uh, accident. And I saw that horrible transporter, and I saw the picture of these canisters which are cylindrical. So I'm really scared what can happen if any of those two horrible things happen, an accident or sabotage or even terrorism. So why I bring this question up is that I've heard all kinds of radiation clouds and other things that can happen. I happen to live somewhere near Malibu, which is about 75 miles or so as the crow flies from this reactor. So my question is, if something happens, something goes wrong, uh, how far should I run from my house? Uh, or, or should I buy the ticket uh, on the new... Uh, Driving down here, I would say uh, running is probably faster than going on the highway here. <laughs> um, th th this is a point 
the, the biggest hazard that has always been while the reactor is operating. Oh, that's the, the largest driving force if there's an accident. Uh, other accidents uh, which could occur on the highway or could occur on rail uh, are also of, of concern. We, uh, we think they're of concern uh, in, in the calculations that we've done. Um, so I don't know how to answer the question, you know, as to how far you should run, but you should be less concerned now that the reactor is not operating uh, because now we've gotten into the state of looking at what are we going to do with the radioactivity that's there uh, and make sure that it's all contained. But the problem is orders of magnitude less than while the company was operating. Question about the uh, containers. How much do they weigh? And second of all, they're designed for about 20 years. We know the ones at Three Mile Island are already leaking. So what do they do? They put them back in the pool, take it all apart, and then they put a new one in? Or do they recast on top of the old one? And does it get to the point where it can't be moved anywhere? Uh, I'm not sure I have an answer to that question. Um, the, I have an answer to the first part of your question, which is how much do they weigh? Each fuel, each fuel assembly weighs almost, um, uh, what, half a ton? Um, and so you put 12, 24 fuel assemblies, that's 12 tons. Uh, but, uh, or 32, 16 tons of fuel. Um, but then you have a container which is fairly heavy, has lead. Uh, well, the canister itself is not, is going to be stainless steel on the order of a half to five eighths of an inch thick. Uh, so that'll weigh a few tons. Um, and then do you take that whole canister and put it into this uh, concrete cast, this concrete container? You're not including that too, are you, in the total weight of the system? Um, when you transport, transport it and then put it into an overpack, a transportation overpack, and when you look at all the schmas that uh, is entailed, um, that can weigh uh, 200 tons. You know, the rail car and, and the cask and the canister and the fuel, uh, the tie downs, uh, that can weigh uh, 200 tons easily. And that's why it can't go on the highway. It has to go by rail uh, to wherever it's going. And in 20 years, what happens? Um, Right now we know, I'm answering a question I know the answer to, which is right now we know if the fuel is damaged, it goes into a container, which is then slid into this lattice work. In other words, it's contained in a container before it's put into the cask, it's a can canister itself. Um, what happens after 20 years if they have to do something, if they have to take the fuel out? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think they, they've talked about what happens if you actually have to take the fuel out. I, I don't know the answer to that question.